Imagine, if you will, a long valley surrounded by mountains, cut off from the rest of the industrial world. The rivers were too shallow for steamboats and barges. The nearest railroad was across the mountain in another state. The roads were nothing more than widened out Indian trails made dusty and muddy from the crude wagons that had traveled them. President Garfield spent the night there once. During the Civil War, he served as a general. He led his troops up Pine Mountain and into national news. Garfield defeated General Humphreys and his Confederate Army in the counter-flanking maneuver at the Battle of Pound Gap. He then burned down the town that the Confederates had built there, leaving a small detachment of men living in tents to defend the strategic mountain pass. Twenty-five years later, a man named Richard Brose discovered a seam of coal there that would later be referred to as the most significant geological discovery in the United States. A few short years later, the area would again make national headlines, but not because of the coal discovery, or was it? Just across the mountain in a place that would later be known as the Killing Rock, a group of men ambushed the Mullins family. The newspapers called it one of the greatest murder mysteries of all time. However, because of the way the case was overseen, 129 years later, the local people are still asking, was the right man hung for the crime? But 20 years after the murders, a story about the cold did hit the local and national news. Quote, I say it was about the coal, but it had more to do with the coal company and the modern cities that they were endeavoring to build in this remote and isolated area of the country." Unquote. Imagine, if you will, having a contract to construct 2,000 houses and other buildings in the area, and imagine that at least a quarter of those homes and support buildings had to be built within two years. When the first set of construction workers stepped foot into the area, they had to walk 20 miles across the mountain to reach the construction site. These first men spent the night in cold, damp tents as there was no hotels. There were no sawmills, lumber yards, or other construction materials for them to use. Everything had to be made on site, and what could not be made would have to be shipped in. But before that could happen, they would have to improve the road across the mountains. There was no restaurant meals or hot water waiting for them at the end of the day. These men were there to build those things and they had only a few short years in which to do so. The Consolidation Coal Company had big plans for this region and had multiple problems to solve. The first of these issues was food and housing. The area was sparsely populated, and the only housing consisted of a few log homes scattered here and there. This meant, in addition to shipping in workers and support crews for the construction project, they would need to import the workforce and support crews for the mining operations. In addition, they would also need to provide housing for both workforces and their families. In the beginning, Consol would set up tent cities and mess halls on both sides of the mountain. But because of the number of men being sent into the area, the small country stores were soon depleted of supplies. It also quickly became apparent that even if given enough time, the local populations were not able to produce enough food to feed the massive workforce needed for the construction. This meant that Consol would also have to ship in food and other supplies for this workforce as well. As the construction crews worked to improve, reroute, and widen 12 miles of road across the mountain, railroad crews finished laying seven miles of train tracks into Elmira, Virginia. The supply trains soon began arriving in Elmira, carrying even more men and equipment. Here the workers would unload up to 20 rail cars per week using nothing but simple tools and back-breaking manual labor. They would then have to hand load the cargo onto wagons and sleds. Teamsters would then transport the cargo using dozens of horses and oxen across the mountain and to the construction sites. As construction progressed, additional work crews and equipment began arriving to help with and expand construction. The men included loggers, architects, masons, railroad men, 
plumbers, carpenters, plasterers, and electricians. Among the first pieces of equipment to arrive were nine sawmills and the equipment for two brick plants with two types of kilns. A dry kiln is used to cure lumber. A lime kiln is used to help to compact the soil as well as to help make plaster and mortar for the construction sites. To speed up construction, Consol would also ship equipment to build two narrow gauge trains which included two small locomotives, all the rails, and two dozen cars. Months before the railroad would arrive in Jenkins, 12 boilers and generators would arrive in Elmira. These would take weeks to drag across the mountain using oxen teams, which numbered more than 20 heads each. Most of the construction materials were made on site. Concrete, glass, nails, and roofing arrived by train in Elmira. The concrete arrived early on and was primarily used in the construction of two reservoirs. The Goodwater Reservoir would hold 1.2 million gallons of water and would be the primary water source for the town. The Elkhorn Dam would hold 70 million gallons of water and be used in the power plant to produce steam. Safety, health, and morale were the first three things on Consol's construction list. Just as one of the first tents erected at the construction site was an infirmary. The first building was a small temporary hospital complete with two doctors and a nurse. This not only boosted the morale and safety of the construction workers, but as part of the deal made with Mayo, it opened its services to the local population, which boosted its public relations. At the same time, a clubhouse was being built near what was then called Goodwater Spring. Early on, the clubhouse will serve a dual purpose. The first had to do with health and hygiene. Because of its location, it was the first building in the region to not only have running water, but to have hot and cold running water. The clubhouse would also serve as a more permanent mess hall, a bathhouse for the men, as well as a construction office. Other parts of the building would serve as a housing for supervisors and visiting company officials. There were other temporary buildings constructed for the benefit of the construction crews. These included a YMCA building which gave the men a place to relax, a bakery which prepared fresh bread three times a day. The bread would be loaded onto wagons by the shovelfuls three times a day and delivered to all the active work sites. The Consolidation Coal Company contracted with Nicola Construction Company of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The goal was to design and build a total of seven towns and two divisions. Although the primary buildings in Jenkins were constructed of brick, there would be many buildings constructed using wood lumbered, milled, and cured on site. This included thousands of homes and other vital buildings in each division. The first division was Elkhorn Division, named after Little Elkhorn Creek of the Big Sandy River on which Jenkins sits. The other division was on the North Fork of the Kentucky River, and unless more information comes forth, we can only guess about the name of the division. What we do know is that Consol Train marked three coal brands to be used in association with the coal mine in Kentucky, of which only two were used, Grenadier and Cavalier Coal. Although we do know the name of the third trademark and the probable reason it was never used, we will not discuss it here but do look for it in a future video. As they would oversee the construction of the houses and other wooden structures built in the area, the Nicola Construction Company brought in thousands of men to do the job. At that time, most buildings were constructed using the pole framing method. This is done primarily by setting upright poles into some form of foundation. The walls and the roof are then constructed after which the floors and ceilings were then added. While cheap, fast, and easy to construct, these buildings are not very sturdy and to construct a second floor is labor and material intensive. Quite literally, the building is only as strong as the poles around which the outer walls and the first floor are built. For a second floor, this building method works best if the outer walls of your buildings are constructed using logs, stone, or brick and mortar. 
but the Nikola Coal Company did not have the men or materials to construct the number of buildings needed for the mining operations to begin in the time frame, nor the specifications given to them by Consolidation Coal Company. Consol made it clear that the railroad would be arriving on both rivers in two to three years. By that time, there needed to be enough housing and support buildings finished for them to start mining. Nicola turned to a Pennsylvanian architectural firm for help. Although we have a copy of the original drawings, the resolution is of such inferior quality as neither the firm nor the architect's name is legible. In addition, we do not know the full story other than the architect invented what is then called box frame housing. In the box frame housing style, the house is built like a box. A foundation is first set and leveled, then the floor or platform is built first, then the walls and the ceilings were added much like a constructing a box. With this method, each inner wall increases the overall strength of the box. A second floor is added in much the same way as constructing a floor or platform on the ceiling of the room beneath it. Because they are so sturdy, this type of construction allowed for almost unlimited stories. Just like a set of boxes, each story sits on top of the last one, and the roof is built last before the inside is finished. It is this type of construction that we have to this day, and it is now known as platform framing. This method of building has proven over time to be a very efficient way of building. Each building would take one quarter of the time in which it took to build a pole framed building of the same size, and each house or building would be ten times sturdier. However, even though the box frame housing would eventually reduce the time needed to build each house by three quarters, it still needed to be perfected. And the Nikola Company would do so over the course of the next 15 years needed to complete the project. Because of the deal that Consol had made with John Mayo, the houses had some specifications never seen in a typical industrial camp. Most camp houses were typically nothing more than shanties. But the houses that Nicola was to build for Consol were to have a fireplace, closets, a kitchen equipped with a cook stove and pantries. In addition, each house would have electricity and a covered porch. The houses would also feature a modest yard for gardening and a private outhouse. By the 1920s, most of the houses would have running water, but the outhouses were still used for many years. There were very few single-story homes built in the Consolidation Coal Cup areas of Ledger County, most of which were constructed after the sawmills were moved out and the construction was winding down after World War I. By this time, the Nicollet Company had perfected the box frame method. They were also shipping materials pre-cut and marked for construction into the area by train. This method caught the attention of another company that had offices in Pennsylvania. The Sears Roebuck and Company had offered a mail order home catalog since 1890 and the latest offering was in 1919, but all the efforts were a failure. The process worked like this. For $100, the Sears Company would sell you a blueprint for a house. The blueprint would come complete with a list of supplies and materials needed to construct the home and the estimated cost of the construction. This worked for a varying degree over the years, depending upon where you were in the country. Sears would end up subcontracting with the companies across the country to supply the materials and build the homes as these plans were often of complex nature. The Sears company was impressed with the idea of these modern style homes being shipped from Pennsylvania to the hills of eastern Kentucky. The Nicola Construction Company was slowing down its operation in Kentucky. As construction came to a halt in 1925, many of the men that they had sent to Letcher County continued living in the homes that they had built. These men took mining jobs and other jobs with Consol, but the men in Pennsylvania, this was not an option. In 1927, the Sears Roebuck and Company printed the new mail order home catalog. This catalog was vastly different from the other mail order home catalogs that they had produced before. The catalog introduced the honor built system in which they sent you the blueprints, materials, and instructions for as low as $2,400. They also had an easy monthly payment plan for those on a budget. 
All the materials were pre-cut and marked for easy to follow instructions if you and two friends were building the home for yourself. But for an additional fee, you could contract through Sears to have the home built. This service is also available with the easy payment plan. Today, most modern houses and buildings are built with the platform framing design. Our sturdy houses today are built because of a deadline to a contract that needed to be met. It is amazing how innovation comes from desperation and adverse situations. We thank you for continuing to support Kentucky Tennessee Living as we bring you the history of the Appalachian Mountains. Thank you for watching our video, The History of the Prefabricated Homes in Jenkins, Kentucky.